Zach has another question. It's particularly appropriate for lots of folks in North America right now, but also Australia, you tend to deal with a pretty brutal fire season at times too, and all around the world. So, uh, his question, he says has to do with air quality and long-term health and performance. I live in rural Idaho and I've been riding consistently or constantly all summer, anywhere from an hour long ride to six hour rides. The air quality has not been great due to the wildfires and dust, and the dust is very fine. The dust is also a constant. I'm either breathing it in during gravel rides or on the road or on the road from the farms. So my concern is what are the long-term effects of breathing on uh, breathing this smoke and dust? And he says, thanks again for creating the podcast and answering our questions. So this is going to be as deep as a Jonathan dive gets. This is not a Chad deep dive. So I apologize, <laughs> but, um, uh, we'll, we'll get into it. So I think, uh, his question of what are the long-term effects of breathing a smoke and dust, they we're going to go into that and look at a study that actually looks at, um, some people just because of occupational needs are, are posed or are, are faced with this hazard regularly. Um, and the answer is it's, it's bad if you're constantly doing it all the time. However, um, there's a lot of nuance to this. So let's dig in. And first let's look at the air quality index. And uh, you're going to have to visualize along with me on a lot of this stuff. And hopefully uh, you can do that. But so the air quality index is a, basically it's a measure of various airborne pollutants and it's a quantifier of what the air quality is like. So you can use different apps. There's like airnow.gov, there's IQ air. There's a bunch of different options that you can look up in their uh, air quality sensors, probably in your local region, and they will tell you what the air quality is. You can also get like sensors, small ones that you can put at your house, either inside or outside. And those can give you a very direct measure of the air quality in a specific room, like when you're training indoors, that sort of a thing. So the air quality index looks at a few things and it's important to keep this in mind. They look at particulates. They first look at something that's called 10 micron and then two and a half micron. So the two and a half micron are much smaller than the 10 micron. And these we're talking microns. This is very small pollutants, things that float in the air, things that are not just, you know, dropping down to the ground. So very, very small things that we cannot see. It also measures gases. So ozone, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, and sulfur dioxide. These are all things that um, are very commonly encountered when we're talking about areas with high pollution, like um, uh, high pollution from manufacturing, from vehicles, from all the other stuff that we have. So big cities, it's really common uh, that they have a lot of that. And there are certain areas too, like down in South America, where they have really, really high ozone. And that's just what it is down there. So uh, it's a air quality index looks at all of those and then comes up with a measurement of what it is. For if the air quality index is zero to 50, that means it's good with little no, little to no risks. If it's 51 to 100, it's moderate. And that really means that like, if you're a particularly highly sensitive person to air quality, you may experience some adverse effects. When you get into 101 to 150, that's unhealthy for sensitive groups. So you don't have to be hypersensitive. You can just be relatively sensitive and you're likely going to notice some issues, um, breathing problems, headaches, um, coughing, Potentially, if you're an asthmatic, absolutely, you'll be noticing these things as well. If it's 151 to 200, that's unhealthy. And in that case, even the general public is likely to be noticing these same effects. Um, not only likely, but you will be noticing these effects. 201 to 300 is very unhealthy and above 300 is hazardous, which is basically where all of us in the North Reno Tahoe region recently have been hanging out for over a month. Um, yeah, so wasn't it like 600 or something in yeah, your area? It's over 600. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know it could go that high. So, um, so you can look at that and then make some decisions on what you're going to do for your training. <clears throat> so here's where we're going to get into a bit more of like the logical thought. And then the, the research that has been done on this, um, endurance athletes are different. Uh, because we breathe more air, because we are breathing more deeply and more frequently, we have a higher frequency of breath uh, when we are riding our bikes or doing anything like that. As a result, we take in more of these airborne pollutants than a person that is just uh, a sedentary individual, somebody that's just sitting around or driving their car or sitting at work, something like that, or just being a normal human. You don't breathe as much as an endurance athlete. So as a result, uh, when you, and they, there are all sorts of things that say athletes or endurance athletes in particular can breathe up to five times as much more air. In some cases, this is an older study, but it said that it's much as 20 times more air. This is back when they were looking at the Los Angeles Olympics that were going to be happening in the eighties. And they were trying to figure out the detrimental effects to the athletes back when Los Angeles had particularly terrible air quality at that time period. So 
the bottom line, whether it's five or 20, we breathe more. And lung, fun lung function is crucial for our performance. If we don't have proper lung function, then everything downstream from that is going to be harmed, which absolutely affects our performance. Um, something that's important if, so if you're breathing in particulates and noxious gases, it can lead to respiratory infections as well. Uh, so it may not necessarily mean that you have lung cancer or that you have an asthmatic event, but it could just be causing a, like respiratory infections. And we all know that when you have a respiratory infection, you can't train well, you can't recover well. And then as a result, your body gets to fight that instead of trying to help you recover from training. So that also just makes you slower. Um, so when you look at endurance athletes, that's why it's very important that we pay attention to the air quality around us. Uh, but let's talk about dusty conditions and it definitely depends on the dust that you're facing and rules of logic apply. If you can avoid dusty conditions, go ahead. If you're a mountain biker and you're racing all the time, you're going to be racing in dusty conditions. So that's just part of that's par for the course. Cyclocross is really similar too. like the early um, some of like the most dusty conditions you'll come across are early cyclocross or early season cyclocross races. Cause everything's just bone dry from the summer. Right. So, um, but keep in mind the dust in most cases is a larger size particle. So it's likely to cause problems with upper respiratory illnesses, uh, rather than getting downward noxious gases and those smaller PM two five, uh, particulates are going to get down to the lower portion of the lungs, which is where things get truly problematic and cause fluid accumulation and all sorts of problems in your lungs. So you want to keep your eye out for that. Um, there was a study and it's called effects of dust exposure on the respiratory health systems and pulmonary functions of street sweepers. And this was done in Zaidan, Iran. And there, everyone here is laughing because I get to try to announce the name, uh, the last name of the of the, the first name Do of the study. It. And I am so sorry, cause I'm going to, I'm going to butcher this, but hobby Baba body is the, I believe what it is at all. We're the ones that wrote this. It's pretty good. And yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> big, big moment getting past that hurdle. Um, so they looked at 84 street sweepers and these are uh, manual hand street sweepers. So, um, that, they, that's like a, a city job uh, for those that are unfamiliar, that's pretty common in a lot of cities around the world that that's a job that they have. So they are literally sweeping the streets. And as a result, they're creating dust clouds and just inhaling it all the time. So they looked at 84 street sweepers and 80 office workers in the same city. Um, Zaidan in Iran, this is around 91 AQI is the average AQI for the whole year, which average AQI is is it, if to have 91, that is very high. That means it's a city likely with a, a great degree of pollution um, because of the fact that when you look at that, that's almost getting into the moderate levels just on average. But when you're talking about peak times, that they're likely experiencing months at a time where it's very, like it's probably even hazardous. Um, so it's pretty tough. I just looked at Zaidan over the past few days, um, for example, leading up to this, and they were almost always in the hazardous range um, or just below the hazardous range. So that's the context. They controlled for BMI. Uh, they also controlled for smoking and other relevant pre-existing conditions with these study subjects. The methods that they use is they ask them to report uh, respiratory symptoms associated with dust exposure, coughing, wheezing, um, like tightness, shortness of breath, tightness in the chest, that sort of stuff. They ask them to report those things. They also um, had them do a pulmonary function test with a spirometer where they basically just uh, measured how the, the force at which they could be able to uh, exhale air and uh, the lung function basically is what they're testing. The results, a bad, bad air quality exposed individuals, so these street sweepers were five to six times more likely to be experiencing respiratory sim symptoms on a regular basis. So that's five to six more times more likely to be experiencing cough, wheezing, respiratory infections, all of that stuff. So if you're an athlete thinking about that, that's, that's bad. That's going to make it so that you just can't train like you want to be able to train. Then pulmonary function showed that exposed individuals. So these street sweepers had significantly lower functionality than non-exposed as well. Um, so the bottom line with this is yeah, more exposure to pollutants means a greater likelihood of acute and chronic airway and pulmonary disorders. Um, but it's, it's really important to keep in mind the fact that these people, this is their job. They are spending over eight hours a day, uh, completely immersed in this sort of environment. And this is what they're experiencing as a athlete. We feel acute effects very often where we'll be coughing after a ride. You'll have like a race cough as some of us call it, or if it's a dusty race, you'll have like a cough going on. And in many cases, 
that's your body doing its job to get rid of any pollutants that actually did enter. And it's getting rid of it, whether it's from your throat or the upper portion of your lungs, it's getting those dust particles out or whatever else you inhaled. But if you are faced with training in smoky conditions or very polluted conditions in the air, Keegan's from an area where like Salt Lake city is a famous spot for having really bad pollution in the winter, um, because of just where it's at the amount of people and everything else that, that happens there. So if you find yourself in that situation, the question then becomes, well, when do I train and when do I not train? And I wanted to take some time to just talk about that really quick about what each one of us do, because it absolutely depends. That's the answer, right? It depends on, on plenty of different things. But I think that if you're getting to the point where it's the AQI is above 150 and it's unhealthy, then I don't think it's advisable for anybody to be training in those sort of conditions. Uh, that's probably a safe bet across the board. Now, I don't think anything magic happens from 149 to 150. It doesn't hit some sort of threshold, I don't believe. So if you're like on the fence and it's, oh, it's 149, it's 150, I'm going to go train. Once again, use logic here. And remember, it's not a system of steps, but it's a system of faders that you're working with. So, um, but I want to take the time to ask, I guess, what all of us, what we do. Um, Pete, do you have any sort of, or actually let's go to Keegan first. Um, Keegan, what sort of rules do you have for yourself with air quality and training? Um, yeah, I have uh, a lot of, fair bit of rules myself, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a bit of a, bummer that we now have to think about this. It's probably going to be the way it is for the next mm -hmm. foreseeable future. Um, but yeah. Uh, so basically if it's like, I'll, I'll start at the high end. If it's at like hundred to one fifty, like I'll ride outside, but I try and keep it like zone one, two, super chill. If it's like closer to one, like 130, 150, then I probably just will do like recovery or I'll ride inside. Um, and then like if it's floating in between like 80 and a hundred, then like if I have like a, let's say I have like VO2 intervals that day and they're not like super key intervals, I'll probably just switch that workout and do endurance outside, um, and try and like not go too hard and, you know, keep it below zone three. Um, if it's like, um, let's see. And then I guess like for racing, like if it's over a hundred, I just won't race. Like at Breck, there was a day where it was floating around, it hit like 80. And I was like, if it's a hundred tomorrow, I'm just not starting. Like to me, it's not worth it. Like it's, we don't really know how bad it like can affect you for the future. And I just don't think it's like worth one race. Um, so that's kind of my rules. And I think if it's like, uh, like 50 to 80, I'm okay doing like harder intervals outside and it's that's cool but i think you have to be as flexible and like oh i'm gonna swap this workout and do vo2 instead of doing intervals i'm just gonna do an endurance ride and if it's clean tomorrow then i'll just do my intervals tomorrow um or you just ride inside you know um i did that a couple times this year it was like aqi was like 160 and i was like i'm not even gonna bother going outside especially if it's like recovery ride you might as well just ride inside it's easy anyway and keep it super chill. Or if you have a hard workout, you just put the air purifier on and, um, AC and do your workout indoors. I just think it's like, at least for me, like I personally don't think it's like not, it's not worth risking it. There's just not enough like studies to show maybe in 20 years, like it's going to give us all lung cancer, you know? Um, yeah. and then also I think it's pretty easy like to pay attention to purple air, or whatever app you use. And like, there was one day where it was 150 down here in the valley in Heber. And it was also bad in like Park City, like all the surrounding valleys. So I just rode up and I just did laps open over Guardsman Pass because it was only like 80 up there. So I just was up there for like three hours just doing laps up in like a 10 mile stretch of road. So I think you can get pretty creative and like do things like that. Or sometimes it's like super clear out in the east side of Heber and I'll go right east instead of going west. Cause I like, go oh, purple air says it's 40 over here, but it's 60 over there. And even though it's only 20 points, like I think that makes a difference and the cleaner air you can get the better, like, or you can get in a car and drive somewhere. I think like it's pretty easy just to look at that stuff and kind of make the call like, Oh, I'm going to go this direction or I'm going to do that. And like, for me, I'd rather drive a few minutes or, you know, ride somewhere and just do laps than breathe in bad air or, or just ride inside. So kind of my general guidelines. Pete, how about you? Um, uh, pretty similar to Keegan, actually hundreds sort of my, um, 
usually if it's above a hundred, I'll just ride inside. Um, it's pretty easy. And then I'm not stressed about it. Uh, if it's close, I, I do try to pay attention, especially this time of year. Um, I look at purple air and I'll just pick the direction, right? Like some of the time in the Northwest, it's much clearer than down South or sometimes down South Washoe's clear or something like that. So definitely pick my direction. Um, and it's the same sort of thing where if it's not a key workout, uh, or, you know, it's not my one workout of the week that I'm really trying to nail, I'll probably push or mm -hmm. re restructure the week based on hopefully the air changing. Um, and then this year we've had kind of more smoke than ever. And, um, it's, there's times where I really need, to, I feel like I need to ride, uh, you know, the ride is just as much for me as, uh, for the fitness. And so driving an hour or two, um, and getting away from it. And so you're able to just kind of, uh, think about, you know, not worry about the air while you're riding, um, is worth it for me now. And I, I feel lucky that that's something I can do, but, um, that's sometimes that's just as important as like getting the key session is being able to drive and ride your bike like you normally would. Um, and I think around here, it's been that it's been smoky for weeks now. And I can feel we've had more discussions in the office and with other people that you can just feel like kind of the, the mounting, uh, pressure of not being able to do all the things you want to be able to do. Um, and so I think relieving that pressure a little bit with a little drive to, uh, get a ride in where it's only 50 or 70 or something like that seems, seems worth it to me. Mm. Uh, Ivy living in Montana, you face this too, right? With wildfires yeah. in particular. Yeah. It's like been a seasonal thing since I feel like I was growing up. Um, mm. like it's always something that we've had to deal with and yeah, I'm fortunate enough that I've been working remotely for years now. And so, um, my approach is a little different instead of like restructuring workouts, I'll look more at like the breadth of my season and like what I'm supposed to be doing at that time. And if it's like early summer and I'm just doing like endurance workouts anyways, like I'll usually stay put mm -hmm. and skip a couple days if it's really bad or like, you know, just be fine doing endurance rides as long as it's not, as long as the AQI is not too bad. But for, for like right now, when it's really important to be doing a lot of intensity going in across, I just left. Um, I, you know, I'm fortunate that I have places to stay, like basically around the country that are, um, like I'm here with the, with the squid bikes squad and training and stuff. And, um, yeah, so I just leave. That's how I, <laughs> uh, I, I don't have like a, a number baseline or, you know, I don't, there's no like limiter for me. I just, I think I look at what I'm doing for training and make a decision. And then I would advise that the only important thing to do once you make that decision and like set a boundary is to not, uh, let your homies at home. Like, I feel like there are a lot of people when, when you set a boundary for fire stuff, like everyone has a different barometer yeah. for what they feel okay with. And especially if you have like a circle that you train with, like the, you might get some pressure and some heat that like, it's not that bad and like they feel okay. So I would advise that once you do feel like something is unhealthy and you just need to set a boundary and ride inside or get out of town that to, to feel good about it and stick to it. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a bit. I, 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 I agree with, uh, everyone's approach so far. Um, I want to talk about air purifiers really quick. Cause a lot of people are like, well, why even train inside if outside so bad, isn't it just the same air inside and outside? And that depends on a number of factors. So if your house is like newer and, and like insulation's good gaps, haven't opened up around windows, that sort of stuff, then then you probably have a situation where your house is pretty well sealed. If it has central air conditioning as well, then that's even better because it'll take the inside air and it will filter it as it conditions the air and then brings it back in. So all of that's like really that that's super helpful that you can have, but then even inside you can take it a step further and get like, you know, HEPA air purifiers, HEPA, and those do a very good job at, at managing air quality as well. They usually function, they, they, they have a rating for different square footage. So think of the room or the space that you want to be in. You can have that. Um, I have like air quality indicator uh, measurement for inside and I can see where it's at. And that way I know like, okay, yeah, I can train and I can train hard today because 
uh, I have the filters on and as a result, you know, the room's clear of air. But otherwise, if you don't like, and if you don't have the luxury of air conditioning or, or, or anything like I talked about before, you could absolutely be having effectively the same air quality inside as outside uh, or similar. So that is something to keep in mind uh, for sure. Uh, I think that the key thing is if the air quality is bad, you don't want to be breathing a lot of it and you don't want to be breathing deeply. So as Keegan said, you know, making those intensity adjustments is super important. Um, and if you have the luxury of being able to just change your circumstances, then that's obviously going to be the best. So uh, let us know if you have other questions on AQI. If you're joining us on YouTube, let us know what your threshold is, uh, so to speak, in AQI, not FTP, um, and how you work with that. And, and maybe we can get some good tips and discussion on that. If you like this video, make sure you give us a thumbs up. If you didn't like this video, you can give it a thumbs down, but let us know what you would have done differently in the comments below. If you want to see more of these videos, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you want to become a faster cyclist, check out trainerroad.com. Do it.